Hello and welcome. If you are uh, joining our webinar today, we're uh, we're just going to pause for one moment until the uh, clock strikes the hour, and uh, wait for the majority of our participants to join. You can see the numbers rising as we speak. Okay, um, I can see a good number of participants have already joined and uh, and we've hit the hour. So I'm going to kick off uh, kick off the webinar. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon, and welcome to this Econo Insight webinar. Um, the subject we're discussing today is sustainability legislation, and we're talking specifically about CSRD. Uh, much more detail on, uh, on that later, um, but the question we're addressing is how can CSRD be good for business, specifically? Because we rather like to assume that it's good for people on the planet, otherwise why does it exist? But how can it be good for business? Because the better it is for business, the faster and more efficiently we will achieve the broader objectives. My name is Simon Taylor. I'm Director of Marketing at Ecano Insight, uh, and I'm joined today by two expert panelists, two colleagues of mine, um, who I will ask to introduce themselves uh, in a couple of moments. Um, but before we do that, just a couple of notes uh, and points uh, about the webinar today. Um, we're going to run for about 45 minutes. Uh, and we are going to allow time for, uh, for Q&A at the end, if possible. The session is being recorded, so should you miss anything, uh, it'll be available on demand or for download afterwards. Um, the Q&A is available on your screen, so you should be able to click the buttons at the bottom um, and uh, register any questions you have. We will do our very best uh, to answer all those questions as we go through the webinar uh, or at the end. Um, but in the event that we don't, I can assure you that you'll uh, you'll get a personalised reply uh, from one of our panellists. Um, so a quick look at the agenda you can see on your screen. Uh, I'll, ask, uh, I'll ask Peter and Kaiser to do introductions. And then we're going to explain, of course, what is CSRD? What is the legislation? Then we're going to get into the meat of it. Why is it good for business? Why should it? And why does it need to be good for business? Um, and we're going to finish off with some practical tips um, for all of you guys, uh, for delivering action uh, at the same time as complying with legislation. Um, and hopefully we'll have left time for, uh, for questions and answers at the end. Um, before I ask our panelists to introduce themselves, I'm going to get you guys involved. Um, and I'm going to put a poll on the screen. Um, I'd actually like to, uh, to get everybody here now um, to answer... Uh, the following question. I'll pop it on your screen now. Is CSRD a good thing? So let's get your view to kick this off straight away. What is your current business stance towards CSRD? Um, and I've got five options there. It's fine not to know. Um, there's going to be a full explanation of it all today. That's partly the purpose. Um, while you guys are all uh, all considering that question on your screen, um, I'll let the guys introduce themselves and, uh, and I'll show you the results later. Um, Kaiser, let me let me turn to you first. Kaiser Holst, Head of uh, Sustainability Econo Group. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Well, uh, hi. And uh, yeah, I work for Group Sustainability, uh, which means that I have the luxury to work with the group of company that within the core ID and DNA has an uh, ID for uh, that we should uh, create better, better life for the many people. And luckily we then have six different companies all providing that. So we have a housing a real estate area. Uh, we do have a bank that is preferable when you want to have a better life. Uh, we have insurance and we do have retail that can provide with furnitures. We have an industry factory that produces mattresses and upholstery. And we have this fantastic company called Insight that helps us um, optimize in a better way and also with the CSRD measure. So within that, that's um, uh, that's a lucky star to be here. Uh, I'm having um, 
HR background, but at the time that I was studying, um, the global goals were not uh, uh, were not out yet. And my first job as a 20 year old, I went out to the production site in textile, realizing that when we live by clothes because we get some itches on our skin, there are people out there standing with um, chemicals up to their knees, losing skin. And while they're losing skin uh, and being hurt, uh, people in the environment where we are producing the textile cannot drink water because we are affecting that. So for me, CSRD and working with sustainability and the whole value chain is core. We have to take responsibility for everything we do, even though it's not inside our door. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from. And that's why I'm really glad to be here and talk about this today. Brilliant. Thank you. So responsibility for a very broad range of businesses. So uh, yeah, lots of advice later on. Peter, hi, welcome. Thanks, Simon. And uh, yeah, thanks for the poll. Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to answer it, but hopefully uh, <laughs> everybody who's joining the call can answer it. Um, yeah, so I'm Peter. I head up sustainability at Icano Insights. Um, I've been with Icano Insights about a year. And before that, I was 17 years with uh, Inca, which is the biggest IKEA franchisee. Um, but it's still working with one of the IKEA franchisees with Icano Retail. And I specialize in how do you take sustainability uh, data and turn it into action, um, and then also how to integrate sustainability into the business. So really understanding how you can measure um, sustainability within a business and then transform the business, make sure that everybody's working on sustainability and really take actions. So, yeah, as Kaiser said, CSLD <coughs> is also exciting for me. Great, great. Okay. Um, I'm going to close the poll now. Um, I've just po closed that poll. So I will share the results um, with you in a couple of moments, but I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to get you guys to answer uh, the first question now. Um, so Peter, tell us, uh, tell us exactly what is CSRD? Let's start there, because there are a number of people who probably don't know uh, uh, the full details. Yeah, thanks, Simon. And um, certainly, you know, CSRD, uh, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, is complicated in itself. Um, and I think it's it's part of a broader um, push for sustainability legislation and making sure that companies have proper disclosures. Uh, so the three big ones are the uh, the SEC in the US, um, who have proposed disclosures. Then the International Sustainability Standards Board, the ISSB, have also got drafts out, um, and that will be for the whole world. And then we're focusing today on the EU and the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, firstly because um, they're coming first, and also because we feel it's actually the most comprehensive pieces of piece of legislation. Uh, and it does require all large companies and listed companies, and there are about 50,000 of those in the EU, to disclose information on ES and G. So that's environmental, social and governance. Um, and it's very much about making sure that anybody who wants to, so stakeholders, investors, customers, can have access to the information on sustainability in ESG and the risks around that. And it creates this culture of transparency transparency um, where we can see or everybody can see the impact that companies have on people in the environment and also the impact that uh, the environment and climate has on the company and for the first time it makes it mandatory to have that data audited because mm -hmm. a lot of companies have put this in their annual reports for a long time not all of those companies have added or have it audited so auditability uh, is key here um, and it also makes the, all of this data digitalized so that you can actually start to compare all these reports. Excellent, excellent. Well, listen, it's it's a big thing, clearly, and, and I'm going to turn to Kaiser in a second and just immediately start to address the question, can it be good for business? Um, but just to share the, the poll results with everybody, I'm very pleased to say that nobody 
um, found uh, or, or think CSRD is an inconvenient and costly burden. Um, <laughs> The majority are very positive about it. We have a third um, who believe it's a positive requirement to benefit people and planet, and about a third um, who, who even more positively believe it's a valuable initiative that will help businesses succeed in the future. Um, thank you for answering the previous question, because around a quarter, 25% don't feel they know enough at this stage. So I think helping people understand CSRD uh, is a big part of what we're doing today. Um, and, uh, and a very, very small amount of people left felt it was a, an inconvenient and costly necessity. Um, so uh, that is exactly why we're asking, how can it be good for business? So, so Kaiser, let's start there, just at a high level, because I know we're going to cover the detail um, in depth later. But, you know, why is it good for business? I think as our audience recognize, it's, it's not to talk about CSRD as uh, legislation, uh, something binding that you ha just have to do and uh, it will take time and cost a lot. I think, I mean, where we stand right now with the big climate change that we have to look into and also a year 22 that will go to the history books for what's happening. Uh, I think that we need to look into how both can we be relevant to our customers with the needs of today and also taking the responsibility through the whole value chain. And if we use CSRD then as a guideline, it's actually really brilliant written and it pinpoints so many uh, important offers that will then reach out to the whole organization. And, and we have to stop working in silos. We have to start working together, um, which I think will be a really good change driver for many businesses to be up to the company. Like if you don't get onto the train, you will not be a relevant com company in the future. So I think that with that, it is a change driver and we need it and CSRD can help us become that uh, relevant business offer. But I also think it, it will help us move from fossil fuels. It will help us future-proof business and it will uh, avoid potential taxes and, and reduces cost and, and we can be more energy efficient if we do this right. Uh, so I think that on the high level, let's you can use CSRD, but don't think of it as a taxonomy requirements. Use it as a change driver and mm -hmm. guideline, I would say. I think change driver, brilliant words. Yes, the fact that CSRD can actually be a guide for businesses um, and help make your business more relevant and future-proof is excellent. Um, yeah. So with that, with that in mind, um, uh, it is still legislative. Um, so, Peter, tell us, when does this actually come into effect? When do businesses need to comply by? Yeah, thanks, Simon. And, uh, the good news is that for some companies, it's slightly longer. But if you are a company that currently is subject to the NFRD, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, then you have until the 1st of January next year, 2024, to start collecting the data. Um, and then... You need to report on that data in 2025. If you're not subject to the NFRD, um, but you do have business and even subsidiaries in Europe, from the 1st of January 2025, so large companies, um, and that's defined by more than 250 employees, 40 million in turnover or 20 million assets, you have to hit two of those. You have to start collecting the data on the 1st of January 2025. And you have to know that the data is there in place, ready for 1st of January 2025. So I would suggest, you know, you need to start already looking at that data. And then for the rest of the listed small and medium enterprises, it's the 1st of January 2026 that you need to start collecting data with reports due in 27, but you can actually opt out until 2028, but only as a small and medium enterprise, the rest are fixed. Okay, that helps. And uh, for some that will feel like minutes away. And for others, I guess it's going to feel a little bit, you know, too far away to start worrying about yet. Um, let, let's just consider another component, particularly for those who now feel under pressure um, to achieve a, a very big goal in a short space of time. What happens if businesses don't comply by those deadlines? Yeah, and that's another good question. Um, so we don't know what the sanctions will be in terms of monetary sanctions yet. They are expected to be significant. 
This is for the NFRD in Germany. Um, the fines start at 10 million euros if you don't comply to the NFRD. Um, and then they go up from there. As well as financial penalties or potential financial penalties, you know, if the auditors say that actually you've got some misstatements in here, that can be recorded in the auditor's report. And ultimately, you can have a declaration that your annual report and accounts do not comply with the requirements of the Companies Act, which is very serious for a company. Mm -hmm. OK. Big piece of legislation, not that far away. Pretty onerous impact if you don't comply. Um, let's get into the detail of it now. I know you've got some more information to share now. Um, you know, what does it mean practically to have to comply with this legislation? What a business is going to have to do? Yeah, that's a, a good question because you know what? There's a lot to do. And if you think you've got loads of time, you know, you need to have a look at what uh, is needed. So the first thing, realistically, if you're going to do this in order, um, is that you should run a materiality assessment to look at what is the impact of our business on people and planet, but also what is the impact of climate change and inequality and those things on our business and what are the financial implications on our business. Out of that materiality assessment, you will then see what are the most material topics for your business. And there are some mandatory disclosures, um, which are for all businesses. And then if you look at those material topics, you'll see which are the non-mandatory disclosures you also need to uh, report on. So they might say non-mandatory, but if they come up in your materiality assessment, you have to follow up on them. And then you have these uh, 83 disclosures that you potentially need to report on and um, as part of those there are some other big items so you definitely need to do a climate transition plan so how do you transition to net zero and look at how do you mitigate and adapt for climate change you have to in the EU, do EU taxonomy reporting, reporting on how much of your turnover is aligned with uh, a number of factors then you have to quantify the financial risks on your company um, and you also have to look at the impacts on your workforce. So that's on the mandatory side, but on the man non-mandatory side, there's a lot more things. And for a lot of companies, you'll have to come up with a biodiversity transition plan, which includes the planetary boundaries, and then also a resource and circular plan. So how do you uh, start to become a circular company? So as you can see, um, a lot of things that need to, need to be done for CSRD. Wow. And, and, and in reality, we only have time to scratch the surface of that right now. But, you know, if that hasn't conveyed the, the significance of the task, I don't know what will. So, so <laughs> Kaiser, I mean, Kaiser, from a business leader's perspective, you know, what's your view on, on, on these, uh, these demands? I mean, it's massive and uh, but also super good. I mean, what will happen, for example, if you take the materiality assessment to start from the top, uh, you you will understand the challenges you will face and the financial implication that will hit your company if you do that. And before with the reporting, you have just done the uh, materiality assessment. But now if you do double, you can both see how you affect the world, but you can also see how the financial and climate will affect you, which I think is a very good way to look at it and, and it gives you that whole broad perspective that you need to have. Uh, and then, I mean, this is, of course, when you do the reporting, which you are legally reminded to, it will put the trust and your reputation at place. So if you just and, and, and the CSID is not saying that you should have everything in place, you should just be able to report on on the effects that you're making, which I think is good. But uh, but of course, you want to be a company that does something good as well. Uh, but I think also with, for example, the climate transition plan, it's key because it's gonna, we know we we need we all need to do it. And I think that a lot of employers and people are also very worried and want to see it happening. So I think that that will also help you understand the transformation you have to go to, but it will hopefully also secure the long-term survival of your business and ensure the risks, um, not only for tax and legislation, but also the risk um, 
uh, the ref risk of going the wrong way and not being a company in the future. So, uh, yeah, there are big things, but also super interesting things that will help you put a better stra business strategy for the future. Yes, and, and and that's clearly the big takeout is is uh, as you have done clearly is taking a very positive and proactive approach to it um, is, is going to create the outcome that you desire rather than even seeing it from from the start as as onerous and difficult. Um, it's really about being you know um, making your business right for the future. Um, so let, let's look into it again in a little bit more detail again, Peter. What are the disclosure areas? Um, that people are are going to need to measure and report upon. Yeah, and that they split into the mandatory and the non-mandatory, uh, but they are across four different areas. So you have the cross-cutting standards, um, which are the general requirements and general disclosures that go across the whole. And then you have the disclosures under E, S, and G. So the environmental one, there are five different um uh, five different standards under the social one, there's four and under governance, there's one. And these are all sector agnostic. So it doesn't matter what sector you're in, you have to uh, do all of these, or at least the mandatory ones and the ones that come up in your materiality assessment. There are also sector specific standards that are coming, uh, but they are, um, they're not here yet. So at the moment, it's focusing on the sector agnostic standards. Right. Okay. Um, hi, sir. <laughs> having having seen that list, um, yeah. how are you tackling this? I mean, how how have you guys approached this as a business, um, and and still also uh, at the same time uh, trying to deliver results? Yeah, good question. <laughs> no, but I mean, first of all, you uh, with the CSRD, and what was super important for me to understand is just it, it those metrics that Peter just showed you will be audited on that. And uh, under those, there are like millions of uh, other metrics uh, to understand. And you have to divide that into the organization with finance and HR and risk and sustainability. It's uh, an operational. You have to find who is re responsible and accountable for collecting that and, and yeah, for that data. But I think that the, the other thing that was super important for me to understand with the CSRD is that the process of how you do it will also be auditable. So first, it, for us, it was to put up a really good governance structure. So we have, at group level, we have the steering group, and then we have a work group, and then we reach out to each business to support and help them. And then each business have their own work group with HR, sustainability, finance, risk, operational coming together so that they can look into details of their organization. So I think that the governance structure and the processes to have that in place is really, really important um, across the businesses. And then um, luckily, when we started to do our first um, strategy, um, sustainable strategy, we said, let's be agile because we need to have facts in place and then we need to do this plan. And with you from Insight, we were able to create dashboards that could help us not only put up the goals and, and what we should require, but also to find um, how we, uh, how, how, and those things can really help us in the later phase when we have collected data, both to use that and collect the data, but we can also then, uh, you look worried, Simon, Simon, but you will do this for us. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it, it it will help us help us navigate the process moving forward and pinpoint the actions we need to do to close the gaps, which gives me good comfort. So that that is a good um, thing. But then it's of course to build a solid roadmap. And for us, it's a little bit different. Most of our business will report 20, uh, 2026 and bank will report twenty twenty five. So um, yeah, that. So now it's more about find with that roadmap and and. And having dashboards is more about finding than okay focus now is collect the data that we do have understand the gaps do a materiality assessment bump 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 and then uh, a greenhouse gas in place we do have that now we have to do a climate scenario plan to realize what will it take to get to net zero and okay. then then very, yeah very structured very organized 
Um, Peter, um, before I ask you the next question, actually, that we have, um, I'm pleased to say that a few people have started to submit questions in the Q&A just to reassure them. I'm going to leave those um, to the end, if that's all right. But we've we've got some of the things you've already mentioned. Um, but but just following on from what Kaiser was saying about, you know, taking this very structured approach and, and addressing it, what, what, what in addition do you believe are the biggest challenges um, that businesses will need to overcome? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest challenge to start with is data. And I certainly found that um, both in Inca and in Icano Insight. This data is across the business. Uh, and it's probably data that you've not collected before. So, uh, and if you have, it's probably in Excel. So I think that's one of the big challenges is identifying this data early on uh, so that you've got time to make sure that you have it in place uh, for when you're actually legally required to collect it. And then of course the legislation is changing and you know, the legislation is increasing as well. So staying on top of that with all of the complexity is quite difficult. And it does take a lot of resources um, and it can tie up all of the sustainability resources just focusing on uh, on data, especially or data and reporting, especially if you don't have a big team. And I think that is actually the biggest risk that I see is that, you know, CSRD could stop companies taking the actions that they need to because they're now focusing on let's find the data and let's do the reporting. Yeah. yeah. Which is why it was really interesting to hear Kaiser's approach. You know, you you you've got to keep you know both things going at the same time. So so picking that up, how can businesses get help, Peter? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, there is a shortage of talent out there at the moment, and I think a lot of companies are trying to recruit people to look at this. And I certainly know a lot of the consulting companies as well are really training up financial people into CSRD and recruiting people. I would say there's a lot of online resources out there. A lot of companies have written um, papers. We've got some stuff on our website as well to help companies out. So, you know, uh, get help, have a look on the websites. Um, but then I think the other thing from a help perspective is having a really a proper place to store the data. Um, and that's where a company like Icano Insight, you know, can help on securing that data and reporting so that actually companies can focus on the actions. Okay, excellent, excellent. So turning back to Kaiser, um, you know, uh, there's a theme here, and, and we've been understanding our principal question, you know, how CSRD um, can be good. So within your business, following on from what you were saying earlier, you know, is CSRD changing the Econo Group on a wider basis? Is it is it having, you know, that broader impact that that you're you're looking for, rather than just fulfilling the legislation? Where do you think the balance lies? I have to say yes and no. I mean, we we're coming from um, we're coming from a company where where we already have this in our DNA. So most of the businesses are working with this, and and are when we do our strategies and the business goal, it's part of what we do. But also, I don't. I think we this will help us look in a much broader perspective. It will help us. Things that I, I we, when we start looking into this, we're already doing a lot of things, but are, have we put words to it? No. So many of the things it's there, and I think it's also starting to engage people, and people feel like, yeah, we are a good company. Because sometimes you just do things, but you don't, you don't put it in words, so you don't pinpoint it. But now we will have, we will find it, and we will pinpoint it, and we will have the data in place, and we will start talking about it and make. If we don't have it in place, because there must be places for all companies to improve, or to look a little bit broader, or to go the extra mile. So I think that's where the really important and 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 interesting things will come out. But I think that I mean in the old reporting uh, that was the still uh, the GRI um, reporting that we had before. Um, uh, we were always talking about brand trust and, and employer engagement and, and talent recruitment. That is still there. It's super important. But now people can really look at our company and say, whoa, this is what they do. And we, for ourselves, can say, these are also the places where we can improve. And this is the product plan to improve it. And I think one of the most important things, and I, I can talk forever about this and I, will, I won't, but uh, I mean, 
just understanding the climate transition plan, because everybody's talking about being net zero and save the planet with the climate change that is coming. But just doing your own transition plan will be huge for companies to use the CSRD, becoming better and, and understanding how to be relevant in the future. So, yeah, we, we um, to answer your question, uh, yes and no. Uh, good things are going on, uh, but we can always be better and this can help us. No, very interesting what Sorry, you said. <laughs> right, very interesting what you said right at the start, actually, that you know, if it if it's in your company DNA or has been for a long time, that can make a huge difference. Um, and I know that Peter has has talked to me many times about you know integrating sustainability, you know, throughout your business so it pervades everything that you do. And perhaps, well, as you just suggested, more on these topics uh, another time, perhaps in our next webinar. We're coming to the end of our main section now, really, where we've uh, we've hopefully answered the question. Question, uh, around uh, CSRD being good for business. Um, before we move to the Q&A in a few moments, um, and we have a good few questions, thankfully, um, from our audience, um, I, I want to get you guys to finish off now with some advice, you know, some guidance for our audience. Um, your top tips and takeaways uh, to ensure success. Um, so let's go. Let's go uh, back to yourself. Um, uh, no, no. Let's stay with you, Kaiser. Go on. Give us. The, give us the first one. The first one. Um, get the buy-in from the whole business and work top down. Good. Good. Yeah. That. 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 It, you know. Um, plays to the cultural point we made a second ago, Peter. Yeah, for me, it's about setting the right goals. You know, you need to have measurable goals. The time for fluffy statements that you're going after is probably gone so you need to take your materiality assessment set the right goals and have measurable goals for climate biodiversity social governance okay yep and, uh, and kaiser let's keep taking it in turns okay um in that case i would say start now uh even though i said we had a lot of data in place and we're already doing a lot of good stuff it does take some time to get this in the process to be auditable and, and collecting the data. So start, 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 start. <laughs> start now. Yeah, the clock is ticking indeed. And yeah. um, Peter. Yeah, I think building on Kaiser's point, the data foundation is key. You need to get a solid data foundation uh, in place so that you know where you're getting the data from and having people responsible for collecting that data and providing that data. Right. Yeah, no question. It's all about the data. OK, final one each. Kaiser? I'm building on what we talked about, but uh, resources in place. Uh, and I have to say it's a balance because I I mean, we we at Econo, we like to work a lot uh, within doing. We're not using so much consultants and stuff, but get experts in help because if you do everything by yourself and so get the experts to help you move along quicker. Uh, but um, yeah, resources in the right place. Yeah, you have to make a plan that's right for your business, whether you're going to do it yourself and get guidance or whether you're going to ask others to, to do it for you. Yeah, great. Yeah, find um, a balance there. And Peter, finish us off. Yeah, and I think just going back to the theme of this, uh, this webinar, for me, CSRD will set your business up for long-term success um, and it will ensure the long-term survival survivability of your business. Right. Yeah. Okay. Listen, that's great. Thank you very much to both of you for, for talking so, uh, so uh, in depth um, about this subject. I know there's so much more um, that we could do and, and hopefully people will um, ask questions actually via email after the webinar. And if anybody would like to suggest what we talk about next time, or they'd like to hear in depth in any of the particular subjects we've touched on today, we'll be very happy uh, to do more of this. Um, let's turn to some of the questions um, that our audience have left us. Um, the first one uh, that I got uh, oh, quite early on, Peter, when, when you were talking was who can conduct the audit? Um, you know, does it have to be uh, a company's external auditor, you know, as in as in many financial cases um, or, or are they specialized audit companies who deal with the with this sort of thing? Yeah. And. I mean, a lot of audit companies are now setting themselves up to be able to audit ESG data as well. Certainly, you will find the big four. They have the financial audit and they have the ESG audit side now. 
Um, there are also some specialist ESG auditors coming on to the market as well. Uh, but normally, if you have an external auditor and it's a big enough one, then they will be setting themselves up. So you don't need a specialist audit company, but they do need to have an ESG audit uh, audit side. And, and, and related to that question, actually, when when do companies need to have the information audited? Because you talked about the legislative deadlines, but I guess if this is incorporated into companies' financial, you know, annual reports, et cetera, there might be different time cycles there. And then, of course, there's the process of, of conducting the audit as well. How, how should that be approached? Yeah, so the audit needs to be done on the date that the... Uh, you know the data needs to be there legally so there's no change there's no difference there what i would personally recommend is that the year before if you've got time now obviously um it's getting tight for those under nfrd but the year before i would always ask me the auditor to do a readiness assessment so that you don't go into the first year get audited and go oh we're missing a load of stuff we have our financial statements um yeah not audited so i would I would do a readiness assessment the year before and find out exactly where the gaps are so that the first year you do it, you know you're going to pass that audit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, excellent. And I think I think uh, that there's another question that I'm going to try and paraphrase if I understand it um, correctly. You, you spoke earlier about taxonomies. Um, and I think the point being made here is that um, currently uh, a, a business doesn't have their activities or taxonomies per or the taxonomies perfectly aligned. Um, and, and does that mean they need to restructure so that business activities are aligned to taxonomies and reporting, et cetera? So in the first year of reporting on EU taxonomy, you only had to report on how much of your business um actually fill fill uh, fulfills the criteria and then the second year you then have to say of that part that fulfills the criteria how much of uh, that actually yeah fulfills the criteria itself if you have zero activities um that are taxonomy aligned within your business uh, or would that would fulfill that then you don't need to report on the taxonomy but do you do need to report that you have zero uh, percent of your businesses business that could be taxonomy aligned okay okay hopefully that uh, that that is clear to the person who asked that question um another good one of a very popular subject actually you know particularly for climate are there major differences with the esfr standard ghg protocols iso um you know market based versus location based you know, makes a big difference in scope two disclosures as the point being made. Um, and so, yes, what, what would you say on that subject? Yeah, I mean, the market based versus location based, the ESRS, which is the European Sustainable Aridity Reporting Standards, which is the actual metrics from CSRD, um, they don't they haven't gone into that level of detail yet. Um, they are published on our website if you want to go and read what they actually say, or at least the top line of what they say. I think the good news is that it's been recognized that all of these standards are, you know, not aligned. Um, and part of the work of the ISSB, so the International Sustainability Standards Board, is to try and align all of these so that you don't have different ways to measure them. So I think we will see, you know, a coming together over the next um, few years of what you've got in CSRD, what you've got in ISSB. The CSRD, though, does say that you have to follow the greenhouse gas protocol. OK, OK, thank you. Um... We're hogging, we're hogging Peter's time here, Kaiser. Please, any time, interrupt and uh, and give the. Best no I think he has some good answers. He does. He does. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> this, this next question actually may 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 be of interest to both of you. You know, um, there's a question here that says, "Are you planning cooperation between business work groups? Um, you know, people, teams responsible across different markets and countries." You know, um, how and I think for, from your perspective, Kaiser, this would be great to answer. You know, how have you addressed that when you've got so many different businesses, so many different markets and therefore so many different stakeholders? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, 
we have a pretty clear and uh, simple, but very clear governance structure within the whole econo that we do have. So what we do is um, uh, we have this steering group and then we, uh, and now I can only speak for econo, of course, but we have a steering group and then uh, focusing on CSRD. And then we reach out to our work group uh, that will just go down to each business and pinpoint sort of, like I said, we need to stop working in silos, we need to work together. And we have uh, pinpointed for, for these uh, RS metrics, it's operational, finance, uh, uh, risk, and, and then HR, and then sustainability. So through those people, we then work out in the organizations. And then of course, each business is very diverse uh, 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 within us, so they have to do focusing on what they do. So that is easy. Then we do have councils and committees and, and follow that up into board levels. But I think the, the governance structure to reach out should be simple and then very much uh, focusing on each business. But yeah, so I'm guessing, I hope that I'm, the guessing, I'm guessing the emphasis of the question, of course, is, 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 is that level of integration, you know, across borders, et cetera, essential for success? The governance structure is, yes, 100%. And, and also, you have to have control of the processes. And for us, we will have to report as a group, collecting all the different businesses. And then we do need to work together and have a clear process, all of us, um, for that. Brilliant. Thank you. Peter, I'm just going to throw a quick one back, back to you now, because I think it just refers to, to what was being said earlier in one, answer to one of the previous questions. You know, is there any phased in approach at all um, to the auditing? Clearly, that's on a lot of people's minds. Yeah. And I mean, it, it is a big ask to be audited on all of this ESG data um, straight away, but certainly uh, to my knowledge, the mandatory disclosures and anything that comes up in the materiality assessment needs to be audited at the beginning. Um, I think the good news is that you can start with limited assurance, uh, and then there will be a requirement to move to reasonable assurance. And I can honestly say that the difference between limited and reasonable is significant. Um, so yeah, I, while it isn't completely phased, limited is... Um, it's a substantially lower bar to reach than that reasonable assurance. Okay, okay. We've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a few more questions in. Um, just just going back to materiality assessments, which you've referred to on a number of uh, occasions. Um, what what topics within materiality assessments should people be looking at? So. And it's fairly um, simple to Google the materiality assessment. There is a standard one. The topics come in, there are 26 topics in a standard materiality assessment. They come in five different areas. Uh, the different areas that you look at is uh, the environment. So that's about climate, greenhouse gas emissions, air quality, those kind of things. Um, then you've got social capital, which is you know human rights, data security, those kind of things. Uh, you've got human capital, um, which is about your play, um, labor practices and employee health and safety. Then you've got the fourth one, the business model and the innovation. So that's how you know you manage your supply chain, how you design your products, those kind of thing. And the fifth one is leadership and governance. So that's about your ethics and your competitive behavior and your management and those kind of things. Okay, great. And you talked about some. You you talked about mandatory and non-mandatory disclosures. Just, just touch on a bit of detail about that. Which disclosures are absolutely mandatory? Yeah, um, and actually, it's probably better if I share that slide again, just to uh, give you an idea. So on here, the so the, there's no disclosures in the general requirements. The disclosures start in the general disclosures. So all yeah. of the ESRS2 general disclosures are mandatory. mandatory. All of the climate change um, disclosures are mandatory. And then within the own workforce, um, then some of those are mandatory. And actually, if you have more than 250 employees, even more of those are mandatory as well. Uh, so those are the three which are mandatory for all companies. But as I said, you know, in a materiality assessment, just because the others aren't mandatory, if they are a material topic for you as a business, then they become mandatory for your business to report on as well. Right. OK, makes sense. 
Um, very last question uh, I'm going to put to you, Kaiser, because I think, you know, today has all been about the business um, and, and real world delivery um, of what this is. A uh, great question here. Um, it, is it realistic? Is it indeed part of your strategy to essentially integrate commercial business strategy and sustainability strategy so that your business essentially has one single unified approach yes <laughs> no, but, it, but it really is i mean it, it wouldn't make sense if you didn't use sustainability to enable better business and you for me it goes hand in hand and it's about I mean, yes, financial resource is super important, but there are other values that we need to look into. And there are other effects also that we do. And I think that if you don't do this, you lack piece of the equation doesn't come together. Uh, so I would say, yes, it is. And I think that if you don't today with the, the crazy world outside become relevant and doing good for people out there, what are you there for? What's your USP? Uh, so yes, for me, but what we have done, because it's it's easy for me to sit and say that, and it sounds like dream, but what we really needed to do in the beginning, and what I still want to have when we have done the climate plan, is really strong, sustainable KPIs. That is clear for everybody. That doesn't go into a blurry text that says, this is part of our strategy, this is part of our DNA, but that's also what CSRD is helping. So even though we have a really nice strategy and put things in place, you will have strong uh, deliverables within the ESRS metrics that really helps you get that strong KPIs uh, into moving forward. So yes, use the CSRD metrics and then have that, yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for that. We are now absolutely out of time. Um, it is 45 minutes past the hour. Um, so I'm going to bring the, the webinar to a close. Um, I'd like to first of all say thank you to everybody um, who joined us. Um, all of our registrants uh, and those who, who listened remotely. Um, if we didn't manage to answer any of your questions, um, we have them here on record um, and we will come back to you personally um, with a response. Um, obviously, I'd also like to say a very big thank you to Kaiser Holtz from Ecano Group and, uh, and Peter Jones from Ecano Insight. Uh, thank you to both of you for doing this. Um, we will be running more webinars in the future. By all means, uh, contact us and let us know subjects of interest. Uh, but other than that, thank you again. And uh, I wish you all a good rest of the day and, uh, and weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.